Hello. Um, this particular podcast is intended as a supplemental for some of the issues we'll be looking at in Descent and Heresy. Um, we'll go over these again in more depth, um, particularly in the final class in week 12. But some of these ideas, ideas, if you start thinking about them now and researching around them, will hopefully at least some of them will be of, of use to the document analysis that you'll be doing for the um, in, end of year um, assessment exam. But you can also actually apply these ideas to research in other areas, and some of it might possibly inspire a few thoughts around dissertations and things like that if you're considering a dissertation that's religious studies focused. So hopefully it will be helpful. The ideas we're going to be looking at for this podcast, and I hope you appreciate the high-tech nature of these visual aids, um, are concepts called intertextuality. This was developed um, within literary analysis by a Frenchman, um, Gérard Ginette, who had quite a lot of ideas. We're not looking at everything he said, just a small portion of what he said. Um, mainly he was developing his ideas, I say, for literary analysis, so applying them to novels and things like that more than he was thinking in terms of religious texts. But a lot of what he said not only applies to works of fiction, but also applies to um, sacred scripture and, and that sort of thing, um, books by priests and bishops and imams and people reflecting on theology and all of that kind of related subject matter that we're looking at as well as you know, sort of dissenting religions writing and people condemning other religions as with the quote you've got from the Malayus Maleficarum, things like that. So a number of related concepts to look at. Um, two concepts to start off with. We've got the idea that, um, or Jeanette had the idea, that books can be defined largely as hypertext. The hypertext is the book you're looking at and you understand it and you read it and you look at all of the issues around it and then you consider what is its relationship to hypotext. Ooh, that's going in the wrong direction, there we are. <laughs> um, hypotext are the older books that were written beforehand which have inspired or led to or influenced the book that you're looking at, the hypertext. So um, if you're looking at the New Testament, for argument's sake, then you'd be taking into account, obviously, the Old Testament. You'd be looking at the Tanakh, uh, the, the Torah, the various Jewish books and how they relate and influence the writing of the New Testament. You could also look at the works of a number of Greek philosophers and think in what ways are is Greek literature, various ex examples from Greek literature, influencing the people who are sitting down and writing um, that what will one day become the books of the New Testament. Uh, also, obviously, as we've touched on in lectures, you've got this added layer of confusion within things like the Bible and the Quran and so on, in that there's very rarely one single author. You've got one person writing the book of, of John, and somebody else writing the book of Luke, so on and so forth. And then on top of that, you've also got teams of editors, people, bishops, imams, and so on, depending on which book we're looking at, who sit down and they've amassed all of these scrolls and um, palimpsests and books on this and books on that and books on something else that have come from different sources. And they're, they're deciding what order do we put these in? Are we going to keep all of these ones or maybe we'll have this pile of scrolls over here and we'll maybe not bother with that particular pile of scrolls that can go and become the apocrypha or it can go straight in the dustbin or it can go wherever and then maybe even with the books they are choosing are they editing them are they thinking well this passage doesn't make any sense we need to change the wording here so it makes a bit more sense to the readers we need to adapt this in some way so whereas, you know, if we're thinking murder on the Orient Express, you've got Agatha Christie, the author. When it comes to things like this, there's the, an interaction between a whole series of writers for the Quran, for the Upanishads, for the Bible, for all of the major religious texts. And then you've got the people who are doing the editing on top of it, most of whom are anonymous in as much as we might know that a, a particular decision was made at the Council of Nicaea or whatever it happens to be, but we very rarely know the individual bishops, abbots, monks and so forth, or imams or whatever it is in relation to the particular book, who are sitting down 
making these decisions, amending and then executing them. Um, certainly when we're looking at texts from a much earlier period of history, as when we were discussing manuscript culture, these are handwritten. So you might have a group of bishops who will say, well, we want it done this way, but it's not the bishops themselves who actually write it. That's teams of monks sitting in um, scriptoriums in various abbeys, sitting there scratching away with their quills on parchment. And we don't know who they were and how accurately they carried out the instructions they were given. So in terms of things like spelling mistakes, misunderstandings, missed words, that could subtly change the meaning of a sentence or a passage. You've got all of these issues to take into account. But you could, for example, if we're coming back to this idea of dissertations, pick a, a religious scripture that particularly fascinates you and look at its connection to earlier texts, earlier books, not only within that religious tradition, but also maybe from completely different cultural backgrounds that you believe, uh, um, possibly other people before you, historians, theologians, and so on, believe have acted as hypertext, inspiring and influencing the work you're currently looking at. And this doesn't have to be things that are directly cited. So you can have a book that's influenced by other books without necessarily ever saying, oh, I am influenced by this other book. It just becomes obvious that there is a, a, a strong similarity or a theme explored in one book it is then developed in a, something written 100, 200, 500 years later. Uh, becomes explored and examined. You could very make, make an excellent argument um, that a, a massive swathe of fictional literature, European fictional literature, is influenced by the Bible because it comes up again and again and again in love stories and murder mysteries and adventure novels. The values, the ideas, the beliefs permeate so much of the literature. So the Bible itself becomes a massive hypotext for 101 books that come much, much later and are not necessarily religious books in the standard sense of the term. Um, then we can think about another concept from Jeanette, which was metatext. Metatext is essentially a book written about another book. So to give you an example, um, this one, um, Radical Theologies, an introduction to Radical Theologies, is a book about radical Christian beliefs. So it's full of writings from different theologians and so on, but they're constantly coming back to biblical teaching. So this, uh, at a very obvious simplistic level, is a book not directly about the Bible, it's not sort of going into endless detail about the Bible, but about beliefs and practices and ideals that stem from the Bible. And also it addresses some issues that are quite directly linked to the Bible itself, as well as more general theories and religious practice and ritual and so on and so forth. So that's an example of a meta text, a book written up directly about another book and referencing that other book, talking about that other book, dealing with the issues in that other book. So you could, for example, if we're thinking dissertations or something of that sort, um, take books written by you know, churchmen, imams, rabbis, um, leading Hindu priests, something like that, where they're reflecting on the original scripture, which is central to that religion. Um, or you could go at a, a more um, general level. So something like this, a book of Jewish folklore, which is a, a collection of all sorts of folk tales, fairy tales, that sort of thing, that have developed within Judaism. Obviously, it comes back again and again and again to the teachings of the Torah and the Tanakh and the Talmud and so on. It's It's even where it's not necessarily quoting chapter and verse, those ideas constantly permeate anything that is about Jewish law. So it doesn't have to be some sort of weighty theological tome written by a bishop that you might want to look at. You could simply be thinking of something like this and how this sort of thing connects to religious tradition, religious practice. Um, a couple of other issues we'll look at briefly that were um, talked about by um, Gerard um, Paratext is the, the way a book is laid out, um, the structure of the book. So what's the cover picture? Um, obviously the cover pictures are, are very rarely chosen by the authors. They, they're usually, especially if the author is long since dead, um, they're, they're usually chosen by somebody else. And when it comes to religious books, clearly it's not chosen by the author. So what does the selection of the artwork on the cover 
say to the reader? What does the blurb or the waffle on the back of the cover or on the, the inside flyleaf say to you, the reader, you've picked this off the shelf, you're looking through it, you're, you're thinking about it. These are things put in by editors, by publishers, people like that. You might have, let's say, a, an illustrated Bible with various artwork every you know 100 or whatever pages that they're inserting a picture in. Why have they chosen that picture? Does it add to the text? Does it detract from the text? Does it give a, a skewed impression of the text? Um, how is it being done? Is the book laid out in a particular way to make it more readable, more accessible? And, and you get sort of notions like the women's Bible, the children's Bible, this sort of thing. What's the dis difference between a woman's Bible and a man's Bible? In, in what way is the publisher thinking that they are presenting these things to cater to a particular purchasing market of readers. So it's, it's looking at all of those kind of things, not so not so much the, the actual words within the book put there by the author or, or as with religious texts, the, the group of authors, but how a succession of publishers have handled and changed and amended and added to and um, put their stamp on that particular book and if that in any way changes, alters, subtly shifts the message. Uh, and you could, for example, take something slightly off the wall. You get um, you know, Bibles that are written in street speak, supposedly so that it's more accessible to your average urban 16-year-old. Whether it is or not, I have no idea. But in theory, they're meant to be. So they're, they're taking the gist of the Bible and changing the language to make it more amenable to one person or another. Um, if you speak more than one language, you could look at you know French versions versus German versions versus um, Japanese versions of a particular holy book. How the same text is translated into different languages and what's added, what's lost, what's changed as translators, because that's again part of paratext, not just publishers but translators too. How they handle um, adapting a text from one language and taking it across to another language. Potential mileage there for um, dissertations and things like that. Um, another issue for you to think about, um, to, you can to some extent use this certainly with the document analysis as, as well as dissertations and things like that. Um, epitext is a related concept to the, to the paratext. Epitext is things that have come after the book that are centered upon promoting, discussing, understanding, analyzing the book. So if someone writes a review of a book, that review is epitext. If the author is alive, or was up until recently alive, and they've given a newspaper interview, a TV interview, a radio interview, talking about their book, promoting their book, discussing their book, that is epitext. Um, obviously, when it comes to, to the original religious scriptures, Clearly, there's not TV interviews with anyone, but um, some potentially some things that are more recently written, um, supplementary books. You could argue um, <laughs> the, the Book of Mormon was written, however you want to understand that, by Joseph Smith or inspired by the Angel Moroni, however you want to phrase it, in an era when newspapers existed. So how did the early Mormon church and Joseph Smith himself talk about, present the Book of Mormon? So the epitext is not the book itself, but it's all of the stuff that comes after the book. The, uh, the analysis, the reviews, the discussion, the exploration, the understanding um, of, of that original text. So you could think about that. So when, for example, with the coursework, the, the documentary analysis, uh, you've got, the, um, let's say, the the text by Bernard Gui, for argument's sake. What have other people, other churchmen, people from um, secular society, possibly at a much later date, people from other religions, said about his views or the views of people very much like him when they're writing those texts? Or with something like the Malleus Maleficarum, um, how has that sort of influenced and follow on? So at a much later period, there were feminist authors and, and um, scholars, historians, and so forth, 
who were looking at this very, very misogynistic text, which goes on and on at very kind of ugly length about the role of women as witches and seductresses and leading ministry and corrupting them and so on. And they've analysed it in terms of their um, political understanding of gender, which obviously was very different from the understanding of gender which um, Springer and Kramer, the two monks who wrote it, had way back in history. Um, likewise, you could look at the writings of Mary Baker Eddy and you could think about how that was received both by people who followed her um, and, and believed and accepted what she was saying within the Christian science movement. But how did doctors in the mainstream respond to her commentaries about health and illness and disease and so on? Um, how did newspapers respond? How did, um, well, not TV in her lifetime, but you know, at a later date, how TV documentaries about um, the Christian science movement and things like that? And there have been a lot of other books written about Mary, Mary, Mary Baker Eddy and inspired by her writings, some very much praising her, some very critical of her. How does all of that fit in? So it's understand, you don't have to cover all of this, I mean, you, you couldn't possibly cover all of this in a, in a two hour um, assessment, but choose the elements you want to approach, tie them in with the two questions that you've got to choose between. And then think about how these issues could relate, or whichever issues that grab you, could relate to the text that you've chosen to look at. Um, and likewise, when you're writing essays and so on in some of the other modules, some of these issues could well come into play when you're looking at particular scriptures, whether it's the original sacred one, or things written at a later date, commentaries by, as I say, by bishops and rabbis and imams and so on, when they're adding their own two pennyth worth in to the theological discussion at a much later date. So it's this whole notion of understanding how books work, how they operate, how they're understood. Um, uh, and coming back to a central um, message, a central theme within Gerard Jeanette's um, original writings that books do not exist in isolation. Books are constantly interacting with other books. Um, authors, are, you know, if you're an author, you might have read a thousand other books and ideas from other books, how they were written, good bits, bad bits, all of that sort of thing, will constantly influence you as a writer. And that's as true of people writing religious books as it is true of people writing murder mysteries or westerns or love stories or whatever else. You're constantly surrounded by the, the, the world of other people's writings, other people's books. Um, one you know, idea, again coming back to what we were saying earlier, look at how one religious text influences another religious text from a, a different religion, how they kind of bounce off each other. So something, a very straightforward example would be the Guru Granth Sahib, which the, the book of Sikh, within Sikhism, which talks about Hindu books and talks about the Quran and Islamic writings and Islamic scholarship. It's one of the very few sacred scriptures which makes very overt direct reference to other sacred scriptures from other religions so and that's an interesting one and, and you know, does that lead to later religions that have developed and, and schisms and movements and so on that have come after the founding of the Sikh religion have they been inspired by that have they gone in a similar direction in different directions there's all sorts of issues you can look at within both the other modules as well as starting getting you thinking about dissertations if you want to take something book related within your dis dissertation where you're looking at literature sacred scripture that sort of thing if you want if you've got any questions we'll talk about them in class or you can email them to me and we can discuss them that way okay thanks for listening